And on this episode, I'm talking about what the founders and old revolutionaries called arbitrary government. Arbitrary government was actually one of the grievances listed in the Declaration of Independence. I'll do a little overview of what Jefferson and others were talking about. And what did the founders and old revolutionaries mean by the phrase arbitrary government? And maybe a little bit of how it relates to what we live under today. But first of all, before getting to that, a quick hello and a thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. And I should make a couple of programming notes uh, because I'm traveling uh, to Florida for a wedding for my great friend Tom this weekend. I will not have a show on Friday and it's very likely I will not have a show next week Monday, but I will be back on track. And today I'm not going to be able to go through uh, questions in the live chat during the live show. Uh, because as soon as it's done, I'm heading down to visit with some family in South Orange County, and I'm going to take a little bit of time off today as well. But I hope you guys have had a great weekend, and you're still maybe even having a long weekend. And if you want to follow along with the stuff that I'm going to be mentioning here, I will link to all the original source documents and stuff that I'm talking about on our show page over at tenthamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Well, with that, let's start out with the Declaration of Independence. It's getting close to Independence Day, uh, July 2nd, July 4th, depending on how you count that, Lee Resolution or the Declaration. But here's one of the grievances. I think it's number 20. I guess it depends on how you count it. For abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. This is one of the grievances. What is this neighboring province? What is this thing, arbitrary government? And what were they concerned about this arbitrary government being an example coming into the colonies? This was specifically addressing something known as the Quebec Act of 1774. I'm not going to get into that at all today. But here, uh, Jeff Smock over at the Journal of American Revolution, that's allthingsliberty.com, and of course this will be linked to in the show notes so you can read the full article, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. He writes, essentially, Quebec foreshadowed what the American colonies would look like when most of the other grievances listed in the Declaration were taken together. The suspending of the colonial legislature, controlling the actions of colonial governments, creating new crown-appointed offices, etc. The present in Quebec was the future in America. So there are supposed to be limits on how Quebec was run, and then the crown just changed it on a whim. It was an exercise in pure arbitrary power. And what do we mean by arbitrary power? Because it really, to the founders, was government without limits. If you have a government even with limits and government just does what it wants anyways, that's a government that is still an arbitrary government. It can exercise power based on its own power, not on what was right. Here's James Otis Jr. writing in 1762, giving a great, I think this is the best explanation from the founders and old revolutionaries that at least I've read so far. He says, those governors who can do as they please with the men and money of a country, seem to me to be arbitrary, which in plain English means no more than do as one pleases. So a government has no limits. That is an arbitrary government. A government that is given limits, that just doesn't follow it, that is also an arbitrary government, and it's one of the reasons for the Declaration of independence. Here's Samuel Adams with a similar view, writing for the rights of the colonists, November 20th, 1772. He said, the legislative has no right to absolute arbitrary power over the lives and fortunes of the people. The idea that government could do what it wants, even if it's just a single step, which we'll get to near the end of this episode, a single step means their power really is unlimited. Blackstone, In 1753, put it this way, or this is from uh, Liberty Fund. They said the use of arbitrary power to curtail personal liberty would be to Blackstone, and this is in Blackstone's words, so gross and notorious an act of despotism as must at once convey the alarm of tyranny 
throughout the whole kingdom. So just exercising a power that they're not authorized to do on a small group of people or an individual should be an alarm that they're attacking liberty of everyone. A not so gross and notorious an act of despotism. So if we're trying to understand how the founders got to this, we also have to think about, of course, the people that they read and learned from. So James Otis Jr. and Samuel Adams and so many others, they certainly read the works of of Blackstone. They certainly read the works of Thomas Gordon writing in Cato's letters in the early 1720s. Here's number 36 in July of 1721, referred to arbitrary power, that great source of all evil and wickedness, arbitrary power. So they already had this view kind of hammered home in their readings on liberty. And so when they saw it play out in effect, in practice, of course, James Otis Jr. talked about it in 1762. Samuel Adams talked about it in 1772. Thomas Jefferson wrote about it for the Declaration of Independence. That made it into the final version as well. And that's why Samuel Adams also, along with James Otis Jr., writing in the Massachusetts Circular Letter of 1768 at the urging of John Dickinson in response to the Townsend Acts. He had first published the letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania against those hated acts and then sent them along before they were all published, I'm sure, to James Otis and Samuel Adams and said, hey, read these and do with them what you can there in Boston. And so they wrote some foundational principles as well and pointed out in their view that in all free states, the Constitution is fixed. And then Adams and Otis continued by saying, as the supreme legislative derives its power and authority from the Constitution, we know, and just as an aside here, that Thomas Paine, for example, explained that a Constitution is not an act of government, it's an act of the people creating a government. So if the people who run the government are getting its power from the Constitution, the Constitution get its power from the people, then if the supreme legislative power, if these people derive their power from that Constitution and thus the people, it, quote, cannot overleap the bounds of it without destroying its own foundation. So you're not living in the land of the free to Samuel Adams, to James Otis Jr., to Thomas Jefferson, so many others. If government can change the rules given to it based on who is in power, based on a political view, by the changing winds of social views throughout time, whatever it may be. And that's why John Adams writing in Novanglis, in his Novanglis letter, I'm not sure if this is number two or number three. I forget. I think it's number three in 1774. He said, nip the shoots of arbitrary power in the bud is the only maxim which can ever preserve the liberties of any people. Dickinson, in those letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania, he talked about establishing a precedent. He also wrote in response to the Stamp Act, you had to resist the Stamp Act, refuse to comply with it, because if you comply with it, you establish what he called the detestable precedent. And John Adams was using the same principle here. If you do not nip the shoots of arbitrary power in the bud, even the smallest thing, this establishes a precedent which will grow faster and faster at every hour. And that's basically how he described it following up. He said, the nature of encroachment, uh, encroachment upon the American Constitution is such as to grow every day more and more encroaching. The founding generation, the old revolutionaries, certainly understood the danger of of precedent. George Washington warned against the danger of precedent in his farewell address in 1796. He said, you know, if you don't like what the Constitution, the limits of the Constitution have to say, you know, there's a process to change it. And even if it's good or bad, that's what the people may end up doing. But he said, let there be no change by usurpation, exercise of a power not delegated to them, because that is an arbitrary power. And he said, that is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. So even the smallest thing, even if you like what it may be in the short term, this is a weapon against liberty. You should never, never approach it that way. And that's how John Adams put it, like a cancer, it eats faster and faster every hour. Now, this opposition to arbitrary power certainly wasn't just in the Declaration of Independence. It actually was part of the foundation of the Constitution. And you may know where I'm going to go with that in a little bit. But first of all, I want to mention Richard Henry Lee. Let me see if I can pull this up here. 
Here he is in the Virginia ratifying convention, June 9th, 1788. He was one of the first two senators elected after the Constitution went into effect, but wasn't excited about some of the structures of the Constitution. But here he is explaining these revolutionary principles about uh, limits on power and arbitrary government. So if they're going to have this written constitution for this new general government that has to be based on something, the power comes from the people, they're only authorizing government to do certain things, and if it goes beyond that, there's a problem. He said, it goes on the principle, and this was June 9th, I guess, uh, June 9th, 1788. I'm sorry if I'm saying it twice. Anyways, it goes on the principle that all power is in the people. And that rulers have no powers but what are enumerated in that paper. When a question arises with respect to the legality of any power exercised or assumed by Congress, and we could say exercised or assumed by any part of the federal government, but they're talking about congressional delegation of power in this particular discussion. So again, whenever when a question arises with respect to the legality of any power exercised or assumed by Congress, it is plain on the side of the governed. Is it enumerated in the Constitution? If it be, it is legal and just. It is otherwise arbitrary and unconstitutional. An arbitrary power is doing what he pleases. It's not authorized by the Constitution. And certainly, we know that people like John Adams and so many others said, resist this. John, James Otis Jr. said, resist the first approaches of tyranny. If we do not res resist at first attack, it may soon be too late. Mercy Otis Warren said, resist the first approaches of tyranny. So many great lines talking about opposing these things. Again, to Dickinson in his response to the Stamp Act, he said, if you comply with the act, you have to not comply with government because then they have no reason to stop doing what they're doing in the first place. Here's uh, Luther Martin in J January 27th, 1788. Of course, I will link to all these original source documents again in the show notes. I probably won't publish the blog post for this individual episode until a little bit later today, probably later this afternoon, because I'm going to head out of here pretty fast as soon as this episode's done. Uh, but here's Luther Martin, January 27th, 1788. By the principles of the American Revolution, talking about the Constitution, talking about the structure of the document, delegated and reserved powers, you're only authorized to do what you're only what what has been delegated to, what's enumerated in that paper, how Richard Henry Lee put it, and very similar to how James Madison described it some years later as well. By the principles of the American Revolution, he's tying this whole concept together, those principles with the structure of the Constitution and how the people are supposed to respond to government. Again, by the principles of the American Revolution, arbitrary power may and ought to be resisted, even by arms, is necessary. Again, always resist approaches of tyranny. Resist first, vote later. Resist first, sue later. Resist first, amend later. This is the principles of the American Revolution. This is the principles of local self-government, of sovereignty, of individual liberty. Anything other than that, you're relying on government to do the right thing. And of course, Patrick Henry warned us also in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, he said, show me that age and country where the people put the fate of their liberty in the hands of their rulers being good men. And he said, without a consequent loss of liberty, I say it was lost with every mad attempt. That's my paraphrase. Here's James Madison. With a similar view, we know in Federalist Number 45, he told us that the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the general government would be few and defined, expressly delegated in the document, and those reserved to the states and the people are numerous and indefinite. But he had a very similar view here in Federalist Number 14, one of the earlier ones, November 30th, 1787, I think. He said, it is to be remembered that the general government is not to be charged with the whole power of making and administering laws. Its jurisdiction is limited to certain enumerated objects. Anything beyond that is a usurpation. Anything beyond that is arbitrary power. And arbitrary power was one of the reasons for the Declaration of Independence, for the American Revolution. We know that the American Revolution, whether it's John Adams referring to the beginning of it being James Otis Jr.'s great speech against the writs of assistance where he said an act against the Constitution is void. Now, it's not going to be void just by waving a document or saying a speech. It takes people who have 
Well, Thomas Paine put it best in the American Crisis Number 4. If those who are expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigues of supporting it. A population asking government to do the right thing and waiting for it to do the right thing and complying with the wrong thing until the government changes its mind is a population on its knees begging for scraps. And this is why in his latest one minute video, if you've not been following us on some of these major social platforms and some of the other ones as well, uh, Mike Meharry and sometimes myself as well, we're sharing a lot of foundational principles in like 45 seconds to one minute because that's what these platforms like for the short attention span. And we're reaching and teaching a lot of new people. We got a lot of crazy opposition as well, but it's good to learn what people are have been taught or propagandized by the government-run school system. But this is why Mike Meharry called a living and breathing constitution a dead one. We know that Samuel Adams and James Otis Jr. told us, you know, in all free states, the Constitution is fixed. That doesn't mean that it can't be changed, but the legal meaning of any legal document means today the same that it meant at the time that it was given legal force. And the people who gave the Constitution legal force were the people of the several states, the ratifiers, the people who ratified the document. So if we want to understand the legal meaning, we have to understand that. And if they go beyond that, this is because it has to change with the times and they're not following the process like George Washington told us. You really have a dead constitution. That constitution is nothing. You live under an arbitrary government at its will, hoping that it just follows what it's supposed to do or one part of the government will stop the other part of the government from doing the wrong thing. And we know how that has played out because that's how people have treated it for so long. And at the end of the day, today, we live under the largest government in history and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So a living and breathing constitution is really a dead one. I'll link to Mike's video in the show notes over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. And that's pretty much how Thomas Jefferson described it as well. I hinted at this at the beginning of the episode. In his opinion on the constitutionality of a national bank, this is February 15th, 1791. He first talks about the foundation of the Constitution and then what happens as soon as they go beyond it. And he said this, I consider, again, February 15th, 1791, this is 10 months to the day before ratification of the Bill of Rights, including the 10th Amendment. He said, I consider the foundation of the Constitution as laid on this ground that all powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states or to the people. So the structure of the Constitution is built upon sovereignty of the people. The people have delegated certain powers to the government, and government is only authorized to do what the people have determined in the document what they're authorized to do, those enumerated powers. And then he talks about this arbitrary government. Jefferson was very consistent. He doesn't use the same term, but he talks about how a government that takes a single step. Here, listen to this. To take a single step beyond the boundaries thus specially drawn around the powers of Congress is to take possession of a boundless field of power no longer susceptible of any definition. So a government that doesn't follow the rules is an arbitrary government. An arbitrary government is the definition of a tyranny to Jefferson, to Adams, to Otis, and to the entire founding generation. The government is supposed to have limits, and as soon as it goes beyond those limits, it's using arbitrary power again. This is a despotic government, the very definition of a tyranny. And we're celebrating our 16-year anniversary this coming weekend. And when I registered the domain 10thamendmentcenter.com back in June of 2006, my goal was to reach maybe a single person, maybe a handful of people about the limits of power under the Constitution and how it doesn't matter which team is in charge. Government keeps growing and it violates the rules given to it almost constantly. And we are 16 years later, so far beyond anything I ever imagined. I can hardly believe it. But we're really still scratching the surface because we're taking on the empire, the largest government in history. So every single day, we work really hard to reach and teach people about these core foundational principles from the revolution and all the way further back to where the people that the founders learn from. As my great friend Joe Wolverton put it, he refers to it as the founders' 
recipe. So we're working really hard to get this kind of information out to more and more people, and nothing helps us roll up our sleeves and do that job every single day more than the financial faith and support of our members. If you want to put your financial faith behind a work, you can join us for as little as 2 bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Please don't feel obligated to do that. We're <laughs> coming up on four years of this show here, 16 years of our organization. We're going to keep doing this kind of work every single day, whether you're able to pitch it or not. But if you do have a couple of bucks a month or more, Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. And I do want to take a quick moment to say a huge thank you to a handful of people who have joined us as members lately. There's Linda in Florida, Irvin in Massachusetts, Jacques in Michigan, Kirsten in Oklahoma, Doug and Harold both here in California, and Stephanie in Alabama. I can't thank you enough for your support. That is really an understatement. I can't thank you enough for watching this show, for listening to it, uh, for sharing it, for smashing the like button, for leaving reviews on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform, comments in the archive. All that stuff triggers the algorithm of the mainstream platforms and tells it to show the program to more people. And it really is helping us reach a lot more than I ever expected. Again, that just happens every single day. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to do this kind of work with you, taking a stand for the Constitution and Liberty at its moment of maximum danger, which is 24 hours a day. Again, I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. Reminder, no show this coming Friday, very likely no episode next week, Monday, but I will be here on Wednesday. I really appreciate you watching or listening and sharing and all that stuff. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.